So today we arrive at the final teaching of our second season of They Devoted Themselves before we take a little summer break and return again in the second week of September. And with this then one final reminder, if you can support us with these videos, we would greatly appreciate it. The giving links are in the description down below. Thank you so much for your participation, for your journey with us this past year. I think it's been a really wonderful season of teaching and looking forward to the year ahead. The same slate of teachers has renewed and uh, it'll, be, it'll be good to journey with you again. So bless you in your summer. Thank you for everything. And uh, with that, let's jump into the teaching. Well, the context of our passage this week has Paul thinking about suffering. In the verses right before our reading, Paul is writing about the gift of the Spirit and how the Holy Spirit testifies to us that we are children of God. But then in verse 17, right before our, our, our reading, he turns to the matter of suffering. That as children of God and as co-heirs with Jesus, we will also share in the sufferings of Jesus. And then in the first verse of our reading, he continues on with this theme of suffering. He says this in verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Present sufferings, future glory. Now these two expressions in a nutshell, they really summarize the whole of our reading today. And for that matter, they also summarize the Christian experience, just as they summarize the life of Christ himself present sufferings, future glory. In the opening verses of our passage, we read that not just humans are suffering actually, but all of creation is. The birds in the trees, the fish in the ocean, and all of their glory, we read that all of the flora and the fauna that we see all around us are in bondage to decay. Paul says that they're groaning as a woman groans in childbirth, which is an incredible image, longing the creation is for liberation. And indeed, as, you know, as we see the fires burning across our country and the devastation to our lands through greed and overextraction, it would seem quite clearly that the groaning is only intensifying in these days. And the groaning, we must understand, is a result of sin. Both global sin that has impacted all of creation, but also the specific sins of people against creation. And have you ever considered this? that the brokenness of our world and human sin has caused God's beloved creation to groan, to long for liberation. And next time you're outside, take a look around. Imagine what the scriptures here are calling you to understand about creation. But it's not just creation that is suffering, is it? In, in verse 23, we read that people are also groaning. The impacts of sin and evil have also brought to us great harm. And Paul says that because of this, we are together eagerly, eagerly awaiting the redemption of our bodies. And it is in this hope, he says, that we are saved. But not just us. Right? As we go back to the opening paragraph, we read there that when we are redeemed, so too then will be the creation. Now, before we go on, let me just pause, because that was a lot there. So let me just review and highlight some of what Paul has said at this point. First of all, we learn that suffering is part of the created order's current reality. That we, along with all of creation, are groaning to be liberated. In many ways, we are suffering. We know this. Second, the hope that we and creation have is the liberation that will come. And while it doesn't say it in this passage, the message, the overall message of Roman is, Romans excuse me, is that our liberation from sin and resultant decay has been secured through Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus suffered and died. He too groaned, but three days later he was resurrected with a new body into new life. And in this, he was the first example. Scripture calls him the first fruit of what God has in store for all of his children. In other words, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is the physical example, the embodiment of what Paul is talking about here. Third, and lastly, is that it's important to note that Paul specifically talks about the redemption of our bodies. Now, this is important of an idea enough that I want to pause on it just for a moment. 
Because there is a belief among some Christians that the body, and for that matter, the physical or material order, is, is somehow lesser than the soul and the spirit. That what God really cares about is our souls. And that when we die, we'll be freed from these old, nasty old bodies to go off to be with God in some type of heaven of a disembodied spirits or souls. You know, almost, I don't know what, like ghosts or something. But this is not what the scriptures teach, nor the Christian hope. God created our whole being, spirit, mind, body, soul. All of it has been called good. And while all of it has been subjected to suffering, as Paul writes about here, all of it will also be redeemed. And this includes your body. In the end, when we are liberated finally from suffering in a final way, God is going to resurrect you, including your body. And all of you will be redeemed, just like Jesus was redeemed. This is actually the future hope of the Christian. That at the end of the current age, which will be marked by the appearing of Christ and the revealing of his kingdom, you will experience the redemption of your whole person, along with all of creation, to live with God in a renewed, redeemed, restored, reunited heaven and earth. But alas, right, as we await for that reality, we still suffer. We have tasted the first fruits of joy, of life in Christ. Some of us have been healed, for example. Uh, some of us have been set free from demonic or evil strongholds. And all of these things are almost like foretastes of that future hope, like appetizers of what is to fully to come. But we still suffer, waiting for the full liberation. It's, it's like we're in this in-between reality. That's what Paul's really talking about here. But as we live in this in-between state, Paul goes on to tell us that here too we have been given a first taste, a first fruit of this future reality through the Holy Spirit. It's another way we're tasting the future. The Spirit has been given to us, and he is like a deposit, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, that guarantees to us the future inheritance. But the Spirit, we also learn in verse 26, helps us as we live in this current age. He helps us in our weakness, Paul says. You say, how? Well, first, we read this incredibly in verse 26 and 27, that one of the ways that God helps us, the Holy Spirit helps us, is by praying for us with wordless groans. Now that's interesting. Now, Dr. Gordon Fee is one of my favorite teachers, one of the most brilliant minds of late evangelicalism. He sadly died last year of Alzheimer's. He was a teacher here in Vancouver at Regent College, just a wonderful, wonderful teacher and scholar. He believed that what Paul had in mind here was actually the gift of tongues. That the wordless groans of the spirit that Paul is speaking of here are what tongues are. They are the spirit groaning out on our behalf when we do not know what to pray in the midst of our weakness. Now, he's a far smarter man than I am, so I have no doubt to, uh, no reason to, to, to doubt his understanding of the original languages. That's what he was, was a, a New Testament original language scholar. So, so let me just offer this then as a word of encouragement. To you who have the gifts of tongues, and there are many of you in our churches, don't suppress them. Let them out as you pray, because they could be, in fact, actually the very groans of God praying for you and the world in a way that you don't even know how to pray. And if you don't have the gift of tongues, but sometimes your prayers have no words, just let them out. Groan them out. Just let that wordless tumult and angst come out. And do so in the faith and belief that the Spirit is at work in your life, helping you as this world and you also groan. And when you put all this together, this is interesting. Do you see what's being said here in this passage? The world is groaning. You are groaning. But so too is the Holy Spirit. And thanks be to God for his groans in the midst of our groans, right? But in addition to the Spirit praying, you know, as we suffer along, Paul also wants us to have great faith and he wants us to have confidence. He wants us to know that in all things, including our groaning, God is at work for the good of those who love him. And what is this good work? 
Well, in verse 29 to 30, we, we learn some of these things. We learn that we will be conformed to the image of Jesus, that God is at work in this time to make sure that in the end, we look like Jesus. We learn also that we will be justified. That's what he says here, that, that we will and we have been made righteous to stand before God through no work of our own. And to bring it full circle, in the end, we also learn that we will be glorified. That is, like Jesus, we will be made glorious, seated with God in the kingdom, made full and made sight. We will suffer. We are suffering. But there is glory before us. That is the message of this passage. Now, one final thing. How does one know that they can be secure in this great hope that Paul is speaking about? Well, Jesus' message to his people and to the world was, follow me, which means make him your Lord. And as we do this, as we make Jesus our Lord, we mark this by being baptized. Baptism is the way we fully identify with Jesus' death and resurrection. And in all of this, we are then filled with the Holy Spirit, which Paul says in Romans 8, marks us as children of God, heirs with Jesus of all of the promises of God. Follow Jesus and be baptized and be secure in all that God is promising to creation. If you've not called Jesus as, as your Lord, what's stopping you? What's stopping you from doing that? If you've not been baptized, what's stopping you? Let's take care of that. You know, we were just away in our church leaders with the leaders a couple of weeks ago in a leadership retreat. And one of the things we were talking about and identifying is that in our simple churches, we're not actually seeing many people being baptized. And so I think it'd be a great thing for us to begin to pray about together. Could we pray together that people would begin to hear and, and know the story of Jesus and be baptized into him? Would you join me in praying for that? For now, though, let's wrap up to the teaching. And to all of this incredible hope, we arrive then almost like at this place of being speechless. Just, wow, what God is doing in our world. And what do you say to that kind of incredible hope? Well, that's exactly what Paul says in verse 31. He says, after saying all this, he says, what, 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 what then shall we say in response to all of these things? And so without further commentary, let's just read how Paul answers his own question, beginning in verse 31. Pull out my Bible here. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, well, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he's also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amazing. Just amazing. Have a wonderful summer. We're on to our summer break now. We'll be back in the second September of Sunday, or a uh, second Sunday of September. <laughs> Much love to you all. As I say, have a great summer.